people need to acknowledge that this is an intersection between law enforcement and public health. I'm not asking cops to not arrest these perpetrators because while this is a long-term solution and it is a prevention program, these people are a problem right now today. I did a episode recently with some folks that were talking about the fact that the real problem here starts in the neighborhoods. It starts with the upbringing. It starts with the lack of role models. It starts with all of the social influences and upbringing with these young men that were left with no alternatives, and so they made bad choices, and so they wound up in prison. And putting them in a cage for five years does nothing to help them. So that's why they support defunding the police. They just wouldn't understand that I agree with them completely that that's how they got from where they were to where they are. But if I have a home invasion and somebody is holding my wife at the business end of a shotgun, I don't give a shit what his childhood was like. I don't want a social worker to come explain to me how downtrodden he was. I want a cop to come in there and suppress the crime at the time. So I'm not excusing these criminals for their criminal conduct. And it's interesting when you talk to, for example, the business owners in the black community, they don't want less police. Right. They want more police better trained yes. to do the right thing. And I was saying, you don't want this cop to try to be a therapist, an analyst. You want somebody to come in and suppress the crime. Add someone to the team if you want somebody to come in and evaluate these issues. But while he's trying to assess all of this, a baby can be shaken. Somebody can be shot in the head. You need somebody to come in and control the situation and then decide what needs to happen to re-educate and open new corridors of opportunities. But if we don't get funding to create inclusion of this model into the educational system, and into the rehabilitation protocols, it'll never happen. If you don't put money behind it, it's not ever going to happen. I, I agree 100%. You've got prevention, treatment, and then you need incapacitation. You need to freeze the situation where safety is restored, and then these other two areas can move, move into place. And I also can't agree with you more about the need for funding. This is so critical. And the... Uh, CDC, you know, the, the Centers for Disease Control have just been freed up by Congress recently to even begin to start really looking at violence again because they were sort of frozen out of it for a while because the perception was, and that's, this has been the perception, uh, is that the only way to solve um, violence uh, is through gun control, right? And my thought is setting aside whether we can agree or disagree on um, too many, too many, too many guns near people that are having a, 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 a or who are revenge addicts is always going to lead to a lot of deaths. But my thought is, we now have a way to stop people from being re revenge addicted, and that's called motive control. Motive control instead of gun control offers an opportunity where we can get out of this deadlocked discussion about weapons and start about start talking about something new and science based, which says. Even if this, if, this, if this table right here was filled to the brim with handguns, I don't think you and I would go at each other, right? I don't think we would because our motive is controlled. No grievances, no desire to retaliate. And even if we did, we're not going to pick up a gun. But there are too many other people that would. So we can work on the motives while we're also trying to sort out, you know, weapons laws. Uh, and by doing that, we're 
actually going to start saving lives. And I, this is where I have trouble uh, getting the message through with people that are really gun control addicts. And, and I personally, I think that there should be fewer guns in society. That's my personal view. And I grew up on a farm where I had access to a gun. And I think that's why I think it. It was, that handgun was so close and available to me. And I went after these guys that shot and killed my dog. And I may not be sitting here today, but for that gun, because I right. didn't have my motive control. <laughs> my motive for killing was full on at that moment. Uh, so working on a motive control approach, it turns on the entire medical system. It turns on the science system. It turns on mental health and addiction medicine. It turns on all of these vast institutions that we have sitting on the sideline, not knowing what to do about violence. There was a podcast, the New York Times podcast, uh, a month or two ago, had a, this is an incredible story. It was a, a, a psychiatrist in somewhere in California, and she was um, seeing a teenage male who was brought in uh, by the police on fear that he represented a threat. He was going to kill somebody. She evaluated him and she concluded that he had no diagnosable mental illness, but she was also convinced he might go and kill somebody. But she had no diagnosis to give because medical science has none for that kind of person. And so she said, what do I do? If I give him a mental health diagnosis, this is going to contribute to the you know, ruining of his life. He's going to get treatments he probably doesn't need. He's going to walk around with a diagnosis that's going to impact the rest of his days. On the other hand, if I let him walk out of here, he might kill somebody. What do I do? I have, and, and this, was, this is a, a top-ranked psychiatrist, research psychiatrist at one of the big California universities. And she said, I have no way to treat that boy. And we do now. We do have a way. And that information needs to get out to the medical profession. So if you're going to have a red flag law and you're going to identify somebody that's at a, you know, is a threat, you've got to have something to do with them when you bring them in, other than just throw them in a jail. And this is the way. Uh, but without that research, as you mentioned, without the funding for that work and without funding the education of physicians to be able to use it, we're going to be stuck watching bodies continue to pile up. It's getting worse all the time. And I've been interviewed about this over and over and over after Uvalde and all, people want to ask me about the Second Amendment. I said, do you want to make us safer or do you want to talk about the Second Amendment? Because there are like 20,000 AR-15s on the street now. So you can change the Second Amendment, and that may be great for my grandkids' grandkids, but there's probably a 200-year supply of guns on the street right now I want to focus on what we can do now. Yes. What we can do now. And what you're talking about are things we can do that can reduce people's desire to go exact revenge, to go exact retaliation now. Would it be easier to stop this if they didn't have access to guns? Of course it would. But there are more guns in America than there are Americans because people right. have more than one gun. So there are probably 375 million guns out there. Those aren't going to go away if you change the Second Amendment. They're going to be there. What we got to do is say, what are we going to do about people's motive to use those guns today? This is just something that needs to be center stage. It can be part of the school curriculum. It can be part of dealing with those people if they do get identified. And it really is hijacking the brain. But we can take it back. We can teach them to express this in other ways. And your app that talks about trying these real or imagined transgressors in their mind is truly cathartic. And oftentimes you only have to get like these mass shooters or school shooters. You only have to get them by that moment. That's it may never point. come back again. It may never come back again. 
if you can get them past that moment, because we don't have the ability to predict who's going to do it, but we do have a pathway of knowing how they got to that moment, and it includes a mental emotional crisis recently. It includes, we know most of them happen in September and January, February, when they've come back to school. Mm -hmm. It's usually when they've been rejected or broken up with a girlfriend or whatever. Always a grievance that starts it. Real or imagined. Mm -hmm. Real or imagined. They've been aggrieved. So it's that perfect storm that comes together. And we know that a high majority of them get their guns at home. If we had a huge campaign to lock up the guns, I mean, really, I think back to the Just Say No campaign for drugs, not on how successful it was or not, but just how prolific that campaign was. If we had that prolific a campaign of lock up the guns, it's hard to shoot somebody with a gun you don't have. Right. That's right. If we could identify them and had a reporting system, and then there were people on the other end of that reporting system that were trained with this information could have a profound effect right now. That's correct. And and look at what we do with driving, young drivers. Before you can get behind the wheel of a lethal weapon, which is an automobile in the right hands, we give young drivers a lot of training. And I'm not, you know, everybody talks about gun training in terms of, you know, making sure that you don't keep a bullet in the chamber and making sure that you understand where the safety is and that your finger's off the trigger, all these things, all that's very important. But what we don't train people to do uh, uh, before they acquire a gun is teach them about these, this powerful revenge process and that the weapon, a gun is the, it's the ultimate um, substance of abuse. 